But even if you hit that $754 million jackpot, it would pale in comparison to the budget surpluses the state of West Virginia is <laughs> yeah. running, which is where we bring in our next guest, the Senate Finance Chairman Eric Tarr. Senator Tarr, good morning. Thanks for being with us today. Good morning, Rob. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you here, sir. Let's uh, let's talk about these surpluses. I think I saw the January numbers, and when we total those up, we are now close to a billion for the year, correct? That's correct. Yeah, just under it. Four or seven months in. A, a lot of uh, critics of the surpluses c- cite the fact that so much of the surplus is built on excise tax revenues accelerating because of the increased price of fuel and energy. But when I looked at the numbers and I backed out the surplus from energy, there was still almost $100 million of surplus, Senator Tarr, in that January uh, revenue collection. Certainly, yeah. There's several things that are really driving that up. And one that you're talking about is is the severance tax that we have. Um, the collections are up nearly 300% um, year over year with that. And then, as we know, that that's a fairly volatile tax uh, revenue source for the state, and it goes up and it goes down um, in, with dramatic fashion uh, historically. Um, but this is one of the bigger peaks I think we've ever seen. And then we also, um, when you look at the surplus section, a lot of that is also there for having held flat budgets because we, we see about $150 million per year of revenue increase year over year. And so every year you hold a flat budget, you increase that surplus by about $150 million. So it stacks up in four years, and you know, about $600 million of that ends up being from all the flat budgets. When we were looking at uh, the first of these uh, budget surpluses that came started coming in a couple of years ago, there was a lot of talk about overhauling the state's tax system. In fact, like an over, a complete overhaul on tax reform, uh, rethinking the way we tax people in West Virginia. And then these budget surpluses started coming in. Uh, like an anvil dropping on your head in a Bugs uh, Bunny, Wiley Coyote kind of cartoon here. And that changed the tone of the discussion from overall tax reform to tax cuts and how are we going to give this money back uh, to the people. Is is there still a target for overall tax reform in the state? Is that still a discussion that's alive? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a discussion daily here with our caucus, um, over here in the Senate at least. And, and I know the House has been talking about it as well. And, of course, the governor's been doing a statewide tour talking about it, all, all the different ideas that are being passed around. And We just finished up our budget hearings yesterday uh, in the Senate where we would go through each of the agencies and constitutional officers um, and the different branches of government to look at their, their projected uh, spends that are necessary to continue operating. And then we also went through on Friday and had every agency come in and go through all the, the governor's recommended supplemental appropriations, which those supplemental appropriations are monies that we did not spend from the previous fiscal year surplus, in addition to their surplus request, which would be the money over and above what we have uh, would spend in 23 in our budget. So when we went through those, one of the goals we were looking at is we were trying to figure out exactly what was being spent in the back of the budget, if you will, and that's in the surplus sections or supplemental sections, that actually functions as a base item. In other words, we've been doing it in the back of the budget year after year after year uh, to fund an operational side of things. And so when we going through all that, we're trying to figure out exactly um, what expenditures that we can expect for the next several years that are repeating. Um, so that that's becomes your base budget to work on. Uh, it took a lot to get to that point to try to figure out exactly what, they, what that is because the governor has not given us a six-year plan. And what a six-year plan is, is is the governor will come in and say, here's the anticipated revenues, and by the way, here's the legal obligation to the state based on existing statute. And so he, we've been given revenue estimate and then a collections estimate, so two different estimates where the you know if you have a kind of an art, artificially suppressed revenue estimate in order to maintain those flat budgets. And then you have a collections estimate, and that's what's predicting the surplus side of things. But what we've not received from the governor's office is any kind of, of um, collection of what are our, our obligations of the state going forward. So we've been doing that in the Senate to try to build that and figure out that what that is, and uh, and it's fairly substantial. You know, by, by 2028, it's uh, the base budget has to grow with laws that have already been passed and things that we are been, have been doing out of the back of the budget to the tune of nearly a billion dollars. It's going to be just a little under, just a little bit over, that the base budget would have to grow by in four years. So when we're looking at the revenue coming in, we have to decide how much of a tax cut is sustainable going forward, knowing that we've got those those obligations of the state already. 
And you have those obligations, and you have to do that mathematical equation to figure out how much of a tax cut the state can actually afford. And coupled with that, we have Senate President Craig Blair, who made the statement that unless you do a 50% income tax cut, our studies show that it doesn't make enough of an effect to even have it worth being a tax cut. In other words, 10%, 20% doesn't make a big economic impact, but 50% is where he says it does. So do your numbers work with a 50% tax cut? They don't. You know, a 50% tax cut is uh, $1.25 billion. Um, so that's our, our collections and income tax are about $2.5 billion. It's about a little over 40% of our general revenue. And so when you, um, if you go out and knock out half of that, you're reducing the revenue into the state by $1.25 billion. Um, and so if you look at where we held flat budgets, we by holding flat budgets, we've created a window of opportunity for a tax cut, um, $150 million each year stacking. So the first year would have been 150, second year 300, and that third year 450, and so on. So we've done it for four years, and that gives you $600 million. And the reason is is that you go back through a couple decades, and you, and even considering the recent significant increase um, that includes this, you average those out, and we see that 150 million per year growth each year. And so, as soon as we would provide that, and you can't sustain that forever, especially in this inflationary environment. Uh, we've we've done that. And it's it's really um, controlled the growth of government, which is it's something we're really proud of. But at the same time, you can only do it for so long before you can't afford the services of government. And so if we start increasing that budget now, again, at that normal growth rate of $150 million per year, so that it trends the same as your revenue growth, over the next four years, that allows you – or four to five years. Let's go five years. If you go fiscal year starting 24, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, five years. If you do that, that affords you about $750 million of base budget growth without going above what your revenue collections are going to be in your expenditures. So – Looking at that, if you were to do a $1.25 billion tax cut, then you would be going beyond that $600 million uh, by about $825 million. That puts you upside down about eight hundred. dollars uh, Well, you take the eight hundred twenty-five dollars from the seven fifty. dollars that's, that's your growth that you have available there. So you end up upside down by fiscal year 2028 fairly significantly. And those numbers that we have now are still also um, – pending fairly significant policy decisions that the state's going to have to make. Uh, there's really big issues around PIA that's creating a nearly billion-dollar liability by 2027. Um, there's, in order to fix that, it's, it's anticipated that pay raises would have to occur to offset those premium increases. And you're looking at another $115 million there for pay raises, and then there's about a $60 million pension unfunded liability that goes forward. So, I mean, I'm, it's way into the weeds. The reality is, is that if we go anything we would go beyond a six hundred million dollar tax cut digs us into a deeper deficit as the years move by. And so we do have surplus beyond that, but that surplus are really one time dollars. And one time you should not do tax reform. You should not do ongoing tax cuts based on one time dollars because eventually it's it's like socialism. Eventually the money runs out. You can't keep spending other people's money and, and just to continue to expect it to be there without it, it uh, impairing your ability to operate. And so those one-time expenditures, from the Senate's point of view, should go toward one-time – or one-time revenue should go to one-time expenditures, especially ones that decrease the state's ongoing expense or provide opportunity for improved revenues, such as our economic development activities. Bill? Yeah. Uh, good morning, Senator. Thanks for uh, the information. You provided a lot of uh, uh, different information this morning. Uh, you mentioned you went back to the the back end of the budget uh, and, and about a billion dollars uh, that you found that needs to, that has to be paid every year uh, from the back end of the budget. Uh, does that include? the monies for the deficit and the correction officers, the uh, the teachers pay and the like, is that part of that billion dollars you okay. referred to? It does not include teachers pay. It's if we did not do a raise, um, what it, I'll tell you what it includes. It includes that um, when we were having our budget hearings, we, uh, the uh, Medicaid commissioner said that uh, by about 2026, I believe it was, we end up in a $152 million deficit with Medicaid. That means you have to make that up with general revenue. Um, PIA, 
um, by the time we we get into year 27 is a $367 million per year liability right now. Um, it grows by about another 90 to 100 million by fiscal year 28. Um, in addition to that, the legislature is improving the reimbursement to the hospitals because it's so low that it's way, uh, the reimbursement's way below their expense provided. And we've seen certain hospitals saying that they may drop out because of that. Um, there's another $41 million to correct that. The corrections officers, it takes about $43 million to get it to where we, we can get actually retain and recruit people for our corrections officers for their salaries, but that also has an unfunded pension side to it that you have to fund, which adds another $20 million on top of it. So you're right around $60 million a year that you add the base on that. We did Hope Scholarship. Hope Scholarship is around $100 million a year to pay for Hope Scholarship as we move forward. There's legislation moving through uh, the bodies on both sides, the Senate and the, the House, I believe there are now, um, certainly in the Senate, that's K-3 legislation, which is putting teachers' aides in our um, our first through second, our first, second, third grade classes to go in and assist with reading so that we can get that, that metric back up. Because right now, I think we have around a little over 30 percent reading at grade level uh, in our by third grade. So we're trying to fix that. And that, that adds about $100 million a year by the time you get into your third year of operations with that to the base. Uh, CPS. The, the governor went in and took $83 million from a balance sitting in a fund that wasn't being used within DHHR and took that over to do a pay raise for CPS workers. And that's fine until that one-time balance runs out and the state has to incur that. That ends up being about another $26 million a year for CPS workers to get added on top of that. There's a couple other things that are sitting out there, too, that are questionable um, where federal subsidies going away that the legislature is going to have to decide, do we continue to pay for these services with general revenue once the federal subsidy goes away, which um, one of those has to do with our victims of crime advocates. You know, it's uh, about nine and a half million goes away from um, subsidy that we're going to have to turn and fund with general revenue if we're going to continue to have victims of crime advocates out there. Uh, Senior services in the homes. In March uh, of this year, the Medicaid increase that came through with the COVID response to put uh, care in our seniors' homes, that increase coming from the federal government was $240 million per year. In March, that $240 million goes away, and that was used for salaries for individuals that are going out to our seniors to take them food and those type of things. So there's some serious policy decisions that we have to go through and make. Are we going to do, are we going to weigh the tax cut ahead of those things? And those are all base building items. Um, and it's 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 uh, either you know it's an over or under just by hundred million dollars or more at around the billion mark by twenty twenty eight. Uh, using some some of your numbers, I uh, would it be fair to say you did say you could not afford a fifty percent tax cut? Uh, could we afford a twenty percent tax cut? I'm just throwing some numbers out. So it's a twenty percent tax cut on PIT is about five hundred million. Every every one percent or excuse me every ten percent of reduction in your personal income tax in today's dollars is about $250 million, million decrease in the revenue to the state. Um, so what we have available from the best that I can tell right now, and it still would end you up end you up in 2028, there's still decisions we're going to have to make because it still puts you in a deficit situation, is from having held four flat budgets, that gives you $600 million. So um, if you're going to do it all on income tax, then you're going to have, um, what is that, more probably like a 23, 25% income tax cut, something like that, um, is where you end up. So then it becomes is, is where do you get the biggest bang for the buck for the, for the economic growth of the state plus dollars back in citizens' pockets? How do you accomplish both? That becomes the question right now that we're, we're looking at in the Senate. And if you, to the president's point, um, uh, he's accurate. If we don't hit at least a 50% mark, we're not making a big enough splash to do anything on economic growth with those numbers. It sends the money back to the people, but it doesn't have an economic growth impact um, significant enough to matter. So then it becomes targeting it. And this is where the Senate has talked about for a good while is that we really have to address that equipment inventory tax. And the reason that that's and there to do that is that we know that states that don't tax equipment and inventory have increased income per capita, and it's significant. It goes up. And that's, the reason is because you don't penalize capital investment. 
So if you don't penalize capital investment, you get more of it. As you get more capital investment, you, you increase the productivity of businesses in the state. So that target, if we were to go in and do a, go in and address all six species of property back through a tax rebate or tax credit, however you want to call it, um, rather than eliminating the tax, since Amendment 2 didn't pass, and that wasn't, I don't think that was more about the tax as it was so much about a lot of misinformation and fear mongering for the counties on, you know, okay, well, how do we replace it? Well, it's, we're talking about right here the money's replace it, the $600 million a year is there. That fiscal note is actually about $450 million. So you could go in and do something in that, that, that area to make the state way more competitive. We can bring it down to where we're one of the 10 states that um, don't have an effective tax on capital investment. And you can do that in the ballpark of between 400 and 450 million dollars. And the way that works is it's actually a credit against your income taxes. So it does bring down the income taxes, but it's very focused. It also allows you to go in after the car tax. And so by, by adding the car tax into it, you, you get your, your working poor and your seniors get a tax break with that. That's why the car tax piece of that is so important. The other side of it is that if you, um, the money that's left, you can go back in and then start triggering down your income tax over time as you get a natural economic growth. So the most stable income source the state has outside of the income tax when you're looking at um, things to rely on to, as a trigger for triggering down your income tax is the, the consumption tax. So as you have economic growth, there's more consumption, there's more revenue that comes in off of that, and then you can go down and swap that out to trigger down your income tax. That's the kind of combination of things that we're looking at right now in the Senate um, as a plan on how to get it done. The biggest thing that we're concerned about is it has to be safe, it has to be sustainable, and it has to have an economic impact. And we've got $600 million to work with to do that. Matt Miller. So the House has already put together a bill that would give that 50% decrease in income tax. What is the difference between, say, their numbers that they say it's doable and your numbers on the Senate side where you're saying not so fast? Well, the biggest difference is, is on day one, without ever having, uh, they introduced it on day one, the governor's tax bill to do a straight $1.25 billion tax reduction, which is a revenue reduction on the ability to pay for those things I just told you about. Day two, they put it in finance without ever having the first budget hearing to see what the expenses are going to look like going forward, passed it out of finance committee. Three days later, it's out of the House. They'd had one budget hearing by the time it actually passed the House. And so none of these things that, I'm, that I just mentioned on those, those base building items we're about to see were ever considered. They could not have been considered and then passed a bill like that. That's probably one of the most – in the governor's proposal, it's – you know, I've said it several times. It's the most reckless thing I have seen in in the fiscal matters since I've been around state government up here. Um, so we can go in and do a very effective tax cut that had that does all those things I said. It's safe, it's sustainable, has economic impact without putting the state at significant risk going forward from some future governor having to jack taxes way back up or to have to make significant cuts to – the services of government, you know, being able, we've superfunded roads in order to get potholes fixed and bridges fixed and all that kind of stuff where we've been putting general revenue into that. If we were to go that aggressive, not only are we not going to be able to do the stuff above and beyond, we're not going to meet our, our obligations even at baseline. And same thing for when you're looking at the issues that we're having with CPS, with corrections, which are all, you know, we've got federal issues on both sides of that right now. We've got a lawsuit in the regional jail system. We've got a lawsuit in our CPS system over not providing sufficient services there. So those things have to be corrected. And if we do not correct them, then what happens is the federal government comes in and takes it over. And that becomes way more expensive. So none of that, none, none of their members got to hear any of that before they went ahead and passed out a $1.25 billion reduction in revenue. 
we talk about tax reform. Would it not be easier for this legislature right now to attack things like the marriage penalty and the uh, income levels as far as the percentage of taxes and so forth that haven't been touched since the 1990s and bring those things into uh, our modern day economy and our modern day finances? That would help an awful lot of people. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we're actually considered. Um, the president, and I have been, have been talking about that actually over the past few days is that one of the differences that we're, we're looking at is that in order to get the fiscal note down on a tax credit slash rebate on the uh, six species of personal property that we've been talking about, then what you can do is just put that against income tax, not corporate net. That'll significantly reduce the fiscal note associated with being able to do that. And it gets all your pass-through entities, and it gets all your individuals that way. But then what it allows us to do is to eliminate the marriage penalty. And so we can go in and, and, um, and do that successfully and still have the ability to make us competitive on the personal property tax side of things and put us on a, a significant bite at you know it's probably in the 10% to 15% ballpark of personal income tax and then put triggers to trigger it all down. And then you knock out your marriage penalty and you knock out one of our other economic uh, development inhibitors, which is the personal property tax side of things. Senator, we're about to run out of time in this session, not today's radio show, but the uh, legislative session. Uh, do you anticipate that there will be a uh, tax reform, either reduction or structural reform, uh, in this session? You know, and that's a great question. We will have a bill out of the Senate for the House to consider in plenty of time. Um, whether or not the, the House takes that up uh, during session, I don't know. But here's, here's the other side of that. Is, and I've said this in other shows, it's really not a rush for this session. There's a, there's a really big difference now compared to what we've had with past legislatures in that we have mega majorities on both sides. We do special sessions throughout the year. When we're, when we're coming in for interim sessions, we almost always have a tandem um, special session going right along with it that allows us to address fiscal matters of the state. So we meet fairly frequently on that. And whatever we do now is not going to be active until July, at least July of 23 anyway. So if we if we don't get to it right away here, there's still plenty of time to still get into the effective dates before we would get to July 23 to handle these matters. So um, what, what I think is a um, this sense of urgency that's been put out there is gamesmanship. It's, a, it's very much a false sense of urgency because we can go in and affect this Whenever the Senate and the House come together on agreement, it, it can be done. And that doesn't matter if it's in session or if it's after session. Senator Tarr, do you have time for another question or two, or do you have to go? Sure. Okay. No, no, I'm, uh, I'm good. Excellent. Hey, I have a couple questions for you. And by the way, Delegate Bill Ridenauer, uh for our audience, will be joining us after the next break here. I see Bill's on hold. Bill, be with you in a moment. Don't uh, get impatient on me there. And uh, first question is, in regards to the 50% income tax cut and the numbers that you projected going forward, as you said, and we agreed, Senate President Blair stated that at that level, there becomes a much larger effect on the economy and it spurs growth. Do your numbers take into account dynamic scoring of incorporating that 50% personal income tax cut when you're projecting deficits in the future? So the dynamic scoring you're talking about is the effective tax rate, I think. So when you when you put all the brackets in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's happening right now countrywide um, is that because of the – you get natural growth, first of all, just when uh, of state revenues when you've got extraordinary inflation. And I think everybody would agree we're in an extraordinary inflationary environment. Yes. In addition to all the money that's just been printed that's devalued that dollar to drive that inflation. So – a lot of states across the country are using that situation to drive down their income tax brackets. And the bracket that matters on moving people, so you, you know, when you look at tax reform for, um, for economic impact, you want tax reform that drives capital and drives people into your state, capital being businesses. You know, they bring their capital investment. And when you look at effective tax rates, of course, we tax differently at ten thousand dollars first, ten thousand dollars, and then it, it brackets up. You get a little higher percentage as you go up, and then after you get past sixty thousand, we're at that six and a half percent. That gives us an effective tax rate somewhere around five point eight percent. The 
states across the country are pushing down. They all have legislation moving to push their income tax down. Right now, West Virginia's income tax, if nobody made a change, and West Virginia didn't either, we're about middle of the road. We're right around 23 to 26 in the state, so we're in the country. So we're not extremely competitive. We're not non-competitive. We're average. The states are pushing that down, and there's some predictions from talking to the tax foundation that the median income tax could get to the upper fours, very low fives by the end of you know, end of this year. If that happens, then then it pushes West Virginia out of that middle area. So we do have to address income tax to get it down to at least stay where we are and not lose ground. But you also have to realize that in order to do the personal property side of things, that is a reduction in income tax. It's just a very focused income tax reduction in an area that moves people and capital. And then we can do the overall um, at, you know, starting to, for anybody has an income tax, drive that down over time with that economic growth. So your our effective income tax rate would significantly drop, especially getting rid of the marriage penalty, uh, those type of things. So we can get to where, by doing that focus side of it, that our effective rate at that top bracket, which the top bracket's the one that matters on moving people, we can get it down to where that effective rate is significantly lower. And that's that's one of the things we're looking very closely at. The, the other uh, aspect I wanted to ask you about before we ran out of time also was in regards to the money from the American Rescue Funds that ultimately got put into the governor's uh, private, uh, I can't remember exactly what it's called at the moment, that escapes me, but ultimately it wound up helping to build the Marshall baseball field at Marshall University. How closely is uh, that being examined, and is it considered to be a potential problem in terms of those monies being subject to the clawback provision? Uh, it's being examined very closely. On Friday, we had um, our finance committee. We had a hearing and had the governor's chief counsel in front of committee. We had the state auditor in front of committee, and we had the ethics commission in front of committee on this very issue um, and going through and looking at it because what, what the governor did is um, – he said that the Department of Corrections had expenses related to COVID, and they, they made those expenses, and that those expenses were reimbursable by CARES money. And so he says, we're going to reimburse the expenses that were made in corrections with CARES money. And they moved the last $28 million out of CARES then into a governor's special revenue discretionary account. The biggest the balance that ever has been in the past in that governor's discretionary account was $50,000. Instead of reimbursing Department of Corrections, which is, by the way, still under state of emergency, still has a 1,000 vacancies in it, and is falling in on itself with federal lawsuits for, for that, and we still have National Guard in there staffing our jails. So instead of reimbursing the Department of Corrections for those COVID-related expenses, he put it into his discretionary account and then took $10 million of that $28 million and then donated it to Marshall for AstroTurf, for a baseball field. The only money that went to corrections on those COVID-related expenses out of that account was $280,000 out of the $28 million that went into it. So we're looking at, you know, is – is, first of all, you know, is it appropriate? The, go the governor's chief counsel came in. He says, you know, our advisors told us it's illegal and appropriate. I I'm arguing, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure about the legal side of it, but it's definitely not appropriate, especially given the state of our, our corrections. So what he did is he bypassed the appropriations um, authority of the legislature. We appropriated general revenue to corrections. He pseudo-laundered it, put it into a special revenue account, and then put it out to his alma mater where he went to college. So uh, while he's running for Senate and getting his pictures all done, that's what happened with it. So one of the things we're looking at, and there's two things that, that the Senate's really looking closely at. One, you know, is it laundering? There was a question from a senator. Senator Randy Smith asked, isn't this laundering? And, and the extent of that answer from the governor's chief counsel was no. And that was, that, was, that was the extent of the reply there. The other thing is, is it theft by conversion? And so we're still looking into that. So we've got counsel and attorneys still looking at all this. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm also, you know, wasn't born last night, even if I was born at night. 
Is this potentially an impeachable offense? You know, that's, that's a great question for the House. Happen to have a delegate on the line. I'll be getting to it in about three minutes here. <laughs> Senator Tarr, appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much.